and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. The King of Israel, the Lord is near this. You shall never again fear evil. Fear not, O Zion. Let not your heart hands grow weak. The Lord our God is near this. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with everlasting I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. We worship you, O Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, let the light of these candles signify that you are the light that shines in all the darkness of our lives. As we wait, watch, hope, and pray, guide us all to reflect your light and let it shine. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Having emerged from the waters of baptism as God's new creation in Christ, we confess our sins to God and one another. you, O Lord, that we are captive to sin and thought, word and deed. We have wandered from you. Our wandering said at times turned into doubts that drew us away from you. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from the old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Taken from the book of the prophet Zephaniah, chapter 3. 
Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgment against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of whom you mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned in praise among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Lord, you forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. They will the ground, and the righteousness will the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and make his footsteps away. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. The epistle is taken from Paul's letter to the church of Philippi, chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Alleluia, alleluia. Behold, I send my messenger before your face. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? 
a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in kings' courts. What then did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, but the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for our hymn of the day.
During these four Sundays in Advent, we've been focusing on particular names and phrases from our Old Testament readings that describe Jesus. We said each one is jam-packed with gospel goodness for us. Two weeks ago, on the first Sunday in Advent, Jeremiah called Jesus, the Lord is our righteousness. And that means when God the Father looks at you, he sees the righteousness of his Son, the only one who is righteous, has given imputed his righteousness to you. Last week, Malachi reminded us, the Lord does not change. And since that is true, everything that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection gives to you is already assured. This morning, our Old Testament reading is from the book of Zephaniah, you know, one of those that when you're counting all the books of the Old Testament, you probably will forget, right? You missed that one. Zephaniah is in there, and this reading uh, is actually the, the very last section of the entire book. So it closes with this excellent word of gospel goodness. The first four verses of our reading from Zephaniah are Zephaniah's words, and then if you notice from the text, there was a switch in who's talking. All of a sudden, it switched to first person. God takes over at the very end. Uh, at the last three verses. But what is Zephaniah's message for us this morning? Well, it's God Day Taste Sunday. You probably could have guessed it's one of rejoicing. And that's exactly what he's telling us to do. It fits very well with today's theme. But it's not just our theme for this weekend. We always have a reason to rejoice. As Zephaniah says, the people need not fear. Why? Well, here's the comforting phrase for us this morning that brings us to Jesus. The Lord is in your midst. The Lord is in your midst. Two times Zephaniah tells us this in our text. First, at the end of verse 15, he says, The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. Gives us a, a feeling of Palm Sunday. You know, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and the people are shouting, The King! Hosanna, he's here. And then, at the beginning of verse 17, in the context of a day to come, on that day when he said, the Lord your God is in your midst. Why is that so comforting for us? Well, I would guess that it probably doesn't come as a surprise, perhaps it might, but I don't think it comes as much of a surprise to know that God is with us. Around this time, Advent, Christmas, one of the names that uh, we pick out from the scriptures for Jesus is Emmanuel. Right? The virgin shall conceive, bear a child, just call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with, God with us. Right? Jesus has promised to be with us until the very end of the age. We know that he's with us in the Word. He's with us. Um, intimately connected with us, his life, his death, his resurrection, in our baptism. He is with us in his supper, as he promises to come to us in bread and wine, literally dwelling within us, and where two or three are gathered among us, uh, in his name, Jesus is, is there. So maybe it doesn't come as a surprise that God is with us. Jesus is in our midst as he promises to be, but there's something, I'll say, behind that fact that is the cause for our rejoicing. I'm just going to use Zephaniah's word to jump right to the application for us. He, he tells us that we have a reason to rejoice because the enemy and its judgments, or simply sin, Sin has been removed because of the fact that the Lord is in our midst. When sin is removed, when enemies and judgment are removed, there is no need to fear. And here's the thing. For God to dwell with his people, sin must be removed. Now, for the people of Israel, this reality was clearly shown to them and made a reality through the, the Day of Atonement and the cleansing of the city. You know, in order for God to dwell with his people, the city had to be cleansed. And then 
you've got the Day of Atonement. Those of you in the Leviticus Bible say all about this, and you remember it, right? On that day, the, the high priest confessed all the sins of the people on one goat. Remember, then there was another goat that was sacrificed before the Lord. Its blood made atonement being sprinkled on, on the mercy seat. Uh, the high priest actually got to enter the, the most holy place, sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat before God. And the goat with the sins put on it was sent out into the wilderness. Uh, literally, their sins are being removed from them, being cleansed, sent out. It was a, a sin bearer, right, that was sent out away from the people. Why? Because the removal of sin needed to be a reality. And they needed to know that so that God would dwell with his people. The thing is, and this is made explicit in our reading from Zephaniah, that you know, sinners cannot remove their own sin because they're sinners. It's just not going to happen. I mean, that's like trying to grow oranges from an apple tree. It ain't going to happen. Apple trees produce apples. Sinful humanity, you and I, will produce sin. We will never produce oranges. We will never remove our own sin. So, orange, you're glad we have a Savior. Verse 15. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Notice who's doing the verbs. The Lord has removed the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. The sin that separated and cut you off from God has literally been removed from you, taken away by God. How Jesus suffered the judgment of sinners on the cross. He uh, cleared away your sin, took it away by fulfilling the position of both goats. All right? He is both the sacrifice, shedding his blood for the atonement of the whole world, sin, your sin and mine, and by taking all of your sin and removing it from you as far as the east is from the west. In his death, your sin has been buried in the tomb, and it did not rise with Jesus on Easter morning. Your enemies and their judgments, your sin, have all been removed from you. And that's why Zephaniah can say, the Lord is in your midst. We know that, but we know and trust that God is with us. He promises to be with us. He's with us in, in the Word, in our baptism when we're gathered together in, in the bread and the wine. And because that is true, because we know that's true, then the fact that you are forgiven is also true. Does that make sense? The fact that God dwells with you, since that is true, and it follows, it's also true that your sin has been removed. You are forgiven. You are clean. You are righteous, all because of Jesus. The Lord is in your midst. Therefore, you have a reason to rejoice. Now remember that Zephaniah said that the Lord is in our midst twice. First, he refers to the now reality of God's presence with his people. For us, again, Christ is here with us in the Word and sacrament and the fellowship of the church. And Zephaniah also points us to a day that is yet to come. So he says, on that day, there's a day yet to come. There's a, a now reality of what we have, and we'll say a not yet reality of what we have. Jesus is with us now. Our sin really is taken away. We really are forgiven. And on the last day, on that day, we will know his presence in full. And the reality of being made righteous in Christ in full. Think of it like, well, just a perfect example, we got Christmas coming up. Think of it like a Christmas gift that uh, your loved one wrapped and put under the tree for you. And that's it. It's already been paid for. It's already uh, been bought. It's already yours. It's got your name on it. The reality is you have it in your possession. It's under your tree. But you don't know the fullness of it quite yet. 
you're waiting for the day to open it, right? One day you'll get to open it. One day we shall see with our eyes, in our flesh, the salvation of our God. I just read these verses this past Wednesday at our midweek Advent service, but they're appropriate again for us this morning. This is what we're waiting for. So we're waiting to unwrap Revelation 21. 3 through 4, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. The Lord is in our midst. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Does that sound like exactly like what Zephaniah is getting at in our text. That's the day that we're looking forward to, the day of our Lord's return. On that day it shall be said, Fear not, O Zion, and let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, the mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Isn't that crazy? God's going to rejoice over us in gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt you over you with loud singing. I will gather, the Lord says, those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, sin, death, the devil, God, forever. And I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. And I will, I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Much rejoicing will be had on that day. God himself will be rejoicing over us with gladness. And there's cause for that rejoicing even today day breaks into reality now. What is it? The Lord is in your midst. He has removed your sin. And he is with you to guide you, to keep you, and to carry you through to that day when you will see him face to face when we will be his people and he will be our God for all eternity. Thanks be to God in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the God who is Father before all worlds, God of God. Make sure you have a bulletin with you. Yeah. There you go. Get there. Perfect. Stay right there. Don't move. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. This is exciting.
Sure, yeah, this, I, I like symmetry. This is <laughs> Beloved in the Lord, in holy baptism, these young men were born again as God's children and received into his church. As a further gift of his love for us, our Lord Jesus Christ has given his church the sacrament of the altar and invites his children to receive his sacrament in faith for the forgiveness of their sins. The Apostle Paul reminds us, let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These candidates have received instruction and have been examined by me regarding their sin and their understanding of the sacrament of the altar. Kai and Max, you are about to be admitted to the Lord's table. Holy Scripture describes the life of the church and every baptized Christian with these words. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. You are invited by our Lord to come regularly to hear his word and receive his sacrament. You will continue to be instructed, instructed and nurtured in the Christian faith and life. You're invited to confess your sins and receive the comfort of holy absolution. All this will help you live as the child of God who have been made through holy baptism. So, in testimony of this faith and confession, I now ask you, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is your Lord? Yes, I believe. Do you believe that you are a sinner? Yes, I believe. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for you and shed His blood for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all your sins? Do you believe that in the Lord's Supper he gives you his true body and blood for the forgiveness of all your sins and to strengthen your faith in him and your love toward others? Yes, I believe. Do you intend to continue to hear and receive the instruction of our Lord, confess your sins, and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully throughout your life? Yes, with the help of God. I therefore invite you to the Lord's Supper to receive Christ's precious body and blood for the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Parents and members of this congregation, the whole church shares with you the responsibility and concern for the ongoing instruction and spiritual care of these young people. So I now ask you, will you intercede for them in prayer, and as much as you are able, give them your counsel and aid, that in communion with the church, they may grow up to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ. Then answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, whose Son Jesus Christ loved the young and called them to himself, we ask you to bless these two young men, strengthen them in the faith through the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, so that they may grow spiritually and bring forth the fruits of faith and a life of love toward others for the praise and honor of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We rejoice with thankful hearts in your confession of faith. As you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his holy supper, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Peace. Be with you. Amen. Before you go, we got to make it official. Birth certificate. There you go. Now it's time for communion. We welcome you to the Lord's table. Let's, we can clap for the first. Absolutely. Well done, you guys. Well done. Well done. You may return to your seats, and I'll have everyone stand as we enter a time of prayer. O wisdom from on high, lead us by your Spirit to rejoice in all that you have done to demonstrate your love for us. 
Move the leaders, pastors, teachers, and all the people of our synod to rejoice in the Lord always. We pray. Yes. O desire of nations, bless the leaders of nations, our president and congress, our governors and local leaders. Move all leaders to cease envy and boastfulness, injustice and corruption. Guide our leaders to the honorable people who do not neglect the poor and who strive for the flourishing of all human beings. Bless those who serve in our armed forces and lift up refugees and all victims of war. Bring peace between us and our enemies, and let your peace reign over this broken world. We pray. Yes. O day spring from on high, come to the aid of all who are in need. As you humbly entered this world as a vulnerable baby, help all of us humbly to enter the lives of those who are sick, facing surgery, or dying, to offer comfort and hope. We especially lift up Jane Wicks, Allison, Nancy Gaines, Chris Turner, Barbara Stanson, Donald Wicks Jr., Greg Lucas, Karen Lucas, Anita Keaton, Johnny Lissy, Helen Todd, Kathy Bruno, Erica Brody, David Anton, Randolph and Carol Lucas, Mara Howard, family and friends of Linda Funch, Monica Peschel, and those we name in our hearts. Bring healing according to your will and peace to those whose suffering endures. Thank you for the work of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals who work toward healing and restoration of wholeness. Guide scientists searching for cures for diseases that bring suffering to the world and that their work might lead to healing for many. We pray. Yes. The key of David, let your joy, forgiveness, and peace flow freely in and among the families of this congregation. Empower parents and grandparents to love their children and children to love their parents. Watch over all who travel and comfort families who are separated by many miles. Guide families to be places where your love is demonstrated to strangers as well as to friends. We pray. Yes. O Lord of might, help us to see in the miracles of Jesus a sign pointing forward to that day when he will come again in great glory to restore all creation. Help us to be instruments by which our wandering world may come to see Jesus as the one who alone brings true joy into our lives. We pray. Yes. O Emmanuel, you deliver your people even from the grip of death. Comfort those who mourn and use us to express the hope that comes from trusting in you. Bring us to be with them on that great day to come. And until that day, give us peace to endure life's difficulties. We'll also abide in your love. We pray. Yes. You, O Lord, know the thoughts of our hearts and hear those prayers that come to you in sighs too deep for words. All our prayer we entrust to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, in perfect love for us, Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, became incarnate, died, and rose for our sake. He bestows the benefits of his redeeming work on us as he places his body and blood into our mouths in the sacrament of the altar. It is therefore fitting and right that the vessels used to convey to us his body and blood should be sanctified by the word of God in prayer. We taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the whole house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Most gracious God and Father, whose only begotten Son instituted the blessed sacrament of his body and blood. Bless these linens and vessels for use at the altar of your church. Grant that all who eat and drink the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ from these vessels may rejoice in the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation given to them in this sacrament. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
The Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless these communion vessels and all who receive the life-giving sacrament. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our offering. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary, and we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who alone fills our hearts with joy both in good times and bad times. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
joys this heartbroken world. But the joy of creation, the beauty that points us to you as the creator of all, we thank you, Lord. For the joy of your promise to Adam and Eve to send a Savior. We thank you, Lord. For the joy of saving Noah and his family in the flood, and likewise saving us through the flood of holy baptism. We thank you, Lord. For the joy of your covenant with Abraham and Sarah to bless the world through their offspring. We thank you, Lord. For the joy of your saving the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and guiding them through the wilderness. We thank you, Lord. For the joy of your sending prophets to people who had again rebelled against you. We thank you, Lord. For the joy of Jesus, your Son, who proclaimed, taught, and demonstrated the coming kingdom, and who suffered, died, rose, and ascended. We thank you, Lord. For the joy we receive in the body and blood of Christ. We thank, thank you. you. We praise you. We adore you. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father. In giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. To remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
now receive forgiveness of our sins, life rooted in Christ, and salvation both now and forever. Through the same, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And as we receive the blessing of our Lord, we place our hands out in front of us, one a cup, to remind us that everything we have is a gift from God. We come with nothing to give, nothing to offer, everything to receive. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And we continue with our closing here. <laughs>
Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.